Many Christians do not read the Old Testament, not because they don't have the desire, but because they don't have the understanding. We're familiar with the stories of Moses, Abraham, Jacob, David, Esther, Ruth. But when it comes to this large portion of the Old Testament that we're going to talk about today involving the kings and the prophets, it gets really, really confusing and most Christians just skip it. But you clicked on the right video. And so because of that, for the rest of your life, after watching this video, you will have a firm grasp on this part of the Old Testament. So grab a piece of paper, a tablet as a matter of fact, a pencil, your Bible, and feel free to pause this video as many times as you need as we talk about the kings and the prophets. Now, don't get too overwhelmed, but by the end of this video, you will have mastered everything that's on this Old Testament kings and prophets chart. Now, with that being said, if you enjoy this video and you like this type of deeper teaching, I want to encourage you to click the link below this video and join my online community where I do this type of teaching every single month, twice a month, you can click the link in the description box below. With that out of the way, let's jump in. So we're gonna pick up the story from what is called the United Kingdom. Now, what is the United Kingdom, you might ask? Well, that's a good question. So you'll know that the first three kings of the nation of Israel in the Old Testament were Saul, David and Solomon. So what's this United Kingdom? Well, the United Kingdom was a period of 120 years where all 12 tribes of Israel were united under one king. Saul reigned for 40 years, David reigned for another 40 years, and Solomon reigned for another 40 years, totaling 120 years. But then something happened to King Saul that motivated God to remove the kingdom from him, and we're going to read about it. It says here in 1 Samuel, And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to someone else, one who is better than you. So Saul started off as the king, but he was tripping. He didn't have a heart for God. And God said, you know what? I'm going to take the kingdom away from you and I'm going to give it to someone else. Who is that someone else you might ask? Well, that is none other than King David. And so now that brings us over to the second king. And as you're going to see on this chart, the bad, evil, wicked kings are in black and the good Kings are in white, and the kings that were good and bad are kind of in gray. So now that brings us to King David. Now, what do we know about David? Well, the most important thing is that God establishes this covenant with David. It's called the Davidic covenant. Now, stay with me. Do not click off this video. I promise you this is going to be 30 or 40 minutes of well-spent time for you that you'll be able to use for the rest of your life. Now, with that being said, it says here, your house and your kingdom will continue before me for all time and your throne will be secure forever. Now, why is this important? This is important because it's going to set the stage for some of the things that we're going to talk about here in just a moment. But God basically makes a promise to David and he says, hey, David, I promise that there will always be a descendant that is related to you that will be on the throne of Israel. Now that brings us now to the third king of Israel and this is where things get very, very interesting. This is King Solomon. Now Solomon started off good and then he ended up going bad, which is basically why we have the gray section right here. Now, it says here, for when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. Now, let's keep going. God says this, and the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. And so now I want you to pay close attention to what happens next. In verse 11, it says, Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, Since this has been your practice and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Now, before we move on too quickly, I think there's a very practical lesson that we can learn. God basically says, Solomon, I'm going to give you everything that any man in the world could ever desire. But because Solomon allowed his heart 
to be influenced by these negative worldly things that he was attracted to and his heart was torn away from God, God says, I'm now going to tear the kingdom away from you. And once again, there is a practical thing here where whenever we are being blessed by God and we allow our heart to be led astray by worldly influences and attractions, God will oftentimes remove the very things that he has given us. But there is one condition that God makes, and it's found in verse 13. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. Now, do you remember a moment ago I told you to remember that God made a special covenant with David to say, hey, I am not going to ever tear the kingdom away from you completely. There will always be someone who is related to you that will be on the throne. This is the reason why God could not take the entire 12 tribes away from Solomon, but he took 10 of them away from Solomon and left his son with two of them. Now, we're going to talk about this, and this leads us into what's called the divided kingdom. And this is where much of the Old Testament gets very, very confusing. So let's now talk about the divided kingdom. Well, the kingdom is now divided with the northern 10 tribes retaining the name Israel. And the southern two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, are being referred to as Judah. And each kingdom has their own kings. This is why it is very, very confusing to study this portion of the Old Testament. Because... You start reading this stuff and you start thinking, wait, the king of Israel, the king of Judah, are they the same person? No, no, no. See, now there's a northern kingdom called Israel, the top 10 or the northern 10 tribes. And then you have a southern kingdom called Judah, Judah and Benjamin. And these are two kingdoms that are growing at the same time. And each kingdom has their own kingdom. King. Now, if you want a visual perspective of this, this is what it looks like. As you can see in the blue, this was the northern kingdom of Israel and the capital was Samaria. And then in the south, you have the southern kingdom of Judah and the capital city there was Jerusalem. Now, throughout the history of the Old Testament, you have this group of people and they are called the prophets, right? And so we had Samuel, who was the first original prophet who spoke to Saul and David. And then now we're going to look at how these prophets intermingle or intersect, if you will, with the history of the northern tribes of Israel and the southern two tribes of Judah. But before we do that, it's important for us to understand what the role of a prophet actually was in the Old Testament. So the job description of an Old Testament prophet included the following. First and foremost, they were to call out the sinful practices of the people. Now, as I go through these, I want you to really ask yourself the question, is this what we see people who claim to be prophets today doing? Do we see people having these uh, prophetic word services and most of the time they are calling out the sinful practices of the people? We don't see that going on. Also, they were to warn the nations or kings of impending judgment. And this is the reason why these prophets were not liked because they were coming with judgment. They were coming with negative messages. They were coming to say, hey, if you do not change, God is going to discipline you. And this leads me to the third thing that every Old Testament prophet was called to do. And that was to call the people back to repentance to basically say, hey, I know you've been stuck in your sin. But it's never too late because God will always respond to a heart of repentance. And so if you were to repent right now, the judgments that I have predicted that God is going to punish you with, God may relent if you were to repent. And then the final thing is to comfort them in restoration, right? So these were the main responsibilities of the prophets. Now, what types of prophets were there in the Old Testament? Well, there were writing prophets and then there were non-writing prophets. Now, the writing prophets are the prophets that have written scripture, like Isaiah, Jeremiah, 
Ezekiel, Daniel, Amos, Hosea, we have their prophecies written down. But we also have non-writing prophets as well, and there are four of them in the Old Testament. You have Samuel, as I mentioned earlier. You have Nathan, who prophesied during the reign of David. And then you have these two that you might be a little bit more familiar with, Elijah and Elisha. Now, all of these prophets, both writing and non-writing, are equally as important it's just that some of them wrote their prophecies down and we have them as scripture and others did not. But not only do we have these types of prophets, writing and non-writing, we also want to distinguish between the major and the minor prophets. Now, what's the difference between them, you ask? Well, scholars have separated the prophets into two categories. There are the major prophets and the minor prophets. The minor prophets were called that simply because their books contained less content, and therefore were shorter in nature. So I want to make sure you're clear. It doesn't mean they were less important. It doesn't mean they had less of a ministry. It just simply means that they did not have as much content as the major prophets. Now, how is this broken down? Well, you have 12 minor prophets, and then you have four major prophets, but there are five major prophetic books. Lamentations was written by Jeremiah. Now, you also want to separate these prophets into three categories, and this is very, very important for you to understand the chronology and the flow of the Old Testament. You had pre-exilic prophets, then you had exilic prophets, and then you have post-exilic prophets. Now, Brother Allen, what in the world are you talking about? Well, you have to understand the word exile simply refers to a 70-year time period where God allowed the nation of Israel to be taken captive or to be sent into exile to a foreign nation. We will talk about that a little bit later in this video. Well, there were some prophets who were trying to warn the people to shape up or God was going to ship them out. They were saying, hey, you need to repent. You need to change because if not, it's going to come. The hammer's coming down. So they prophesied to the people before they went into exile, hence pre-exilic. But then there was another group that God sent to prophesy and to comfort the people while they were taken into captivity some hundreds of miles away from Jerusalem, and they were in Babylon for 70 years. But then after that, God allowed them to come back into their land and rebuild it and so God sent some more prophets to prophesy to them, and they are called the post-exilic prophets. Now that brings us to the prophet Elijah. Now, to help you understand this chart, on the left-hand side, I believe, hopefully I got that right, those are the kings of Judah. And as you can see, some were good, some were bad, some were good and bad. But then if you notice on the right-hand side of the screen, you have the kings of Israel. And as you can see, all of them were wicked, all of them were evil, and in a moment, we're gonna see the effect of evil leadership. Well, the prophets who ministered to these different nations are on that particular side. So as you can see that Isaiah and Jeremiah and Micah and whatever, those guys ministered to the southern two tribes or the, tri or the kingdom of Judah. But then you see people like Elijah and Elisha and Amos and Hosea, they minister to the northern kingdom of Israel. So we're going to first look at the prophet Elijah and just kind of get a feel for what these different prophets were actually talking about. So one of the things we see that Elijah did is that he called out false worship. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Now, listen, it's going to get real practical as we look at these prophets. So stay with me here. Okay. How much more practical can it get? Elijah is basically saying the same thing that we need to be saying today to all Christians everywhere, which is the fact, hey, how long are you going to have one foot in the world, one foot in the world rather, and one foot in the church? If God is God, follow him. Go hard after him. But if you want to be in the world, then go be in the world, right? But make a decision and go all in. Obviously, God wants you to make the decision to follow him. But I want you to notice, just like people don't like to be challenged today, 
They didn't want Elijah to challenge them either. And that's why the Bible says they didn't even answer him a word because they knew they were wrong and they were convicted. So notice later on, it says here that Elijah executed all of these false prophets. He took them down to the Kishon Valley and killed them there. So as you can see, the people, they didn't like these prophets. And we're going to see that as we move forward. So now let's return to the chart and now we're going to switch and we're going to go over to the southern kingdom and we're going to hang out with my boy Micah. My son is named after Micah and we're going to see what Micah was prophesying and how that can relate to our lives today. The first thing we see that Micah calls out is this idea of greed, wanting more and more and I've got to have it and I'm not content. I'm not complacent with what I have and I want what other people have. Notice he says, when you want a piece of land, you find a way to seize it. When you want someone's house, you take it by fraud and violence. You cheat a man of his property, stealing his family's inheritance. Micah calls us out and says, hey, this isn't right. You are stealing because you're coveting what you see other people have. He also says, but this is what the Lord says. I will reward your evil with evil. You won't be able to pull your neck out of the noose. You will no longer walk around proudly for it will be a terrible time. Now you can see why they didn't like to see these prophets coming because they came with the judgment of God on their lips. Oh, but it's going to get real, real practical now because Micah also calls out the spiritual leaders of the day as well. He says here, you rulers make decisions based on bribes. You priests teach God's laws only for a price. You prophets won't prophesy unless you are paid. Woo. Yet all of you claim to depend on the Lord. No harm can come to us, you say, for the Lord is here among us. I'm going to leave that one alone, all right? But this is very, very practical as it relates to where many people are in ministry today. Now, Micah has more to say, but we're going to switch over to a prophet whose name is Amos, and his message is even more stern, and he is talking to the northern tribe of Israel. Stay with me. We're going to make our way through this entire chart. So what did Amos have to say? Well, Amos also called out greed. This is what the Lord said. The people of Israel have sinned again and again, and I will not let them go unpunished. They sell honorable people for silver and poor people for a pair of sandals. Can you imagine a culture where people are being sold for a pair of sandals simply because they want to take that little bit of money that they make and go get something else? That is greed. But Amos also calls out sexual immorality. He says, they trample helpless people in the dust and shove the oppressed out of the way. Both father and son sleep with the same woman corrupting my holy name. So my question to you is this, church. How often do you hear people who claim to be prophets today at a church and they have a prophetic word service are they spending the majority of their time exposing the sin, sexual immorality, and there's plenty of it to go around in our culture? Or are they spending most of the time promising things to people that they want to hear? Amos goes further. He also calls out the false religious hypocrisy. Woo, it's about to get crazy here. Notice the language that God uses. I hate all of your show and pretense. The hypocrisy of your religious festivals and solemn assemblies. I will not accept your tithe money. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say that. I will not accept your burnt offerings and grain offerings. I won't even notice all your choice peace offerings. Notice the people didn't make any sin offerings, but we'll leave that one alone. In a way with your noisy hymns of praise, I will not listen to the music of your harps Instead, I want to see a mighty flood of justice, an endless river of righteous living. See, the people were thinking that all they had to do to appease or satisfy God was to bring offerings and they could go and sin, but they could go bring another bull, another lamb, another pigeon, another goat, another dove. Oh, you know what? I'll just bring whatever proper sacrifice that I need to go bring it to the priest. Hey, you know, uh, just let this, uh, slit the uh, head, uh, sprinkle some oil, uh, sprinkle some blood on that. I'll lay my hand on that. Okay, we good? Okay, good. Okay, all right, we good? Okay, good. All right, I'll holler at y'all later. And they will go out and do their own, the same sin. And they'll be like, oh, I sinned again. Let me go get a, a lamb or a dove or a goat or a bull or something. And we go get that animal. I bring it back to the priest. 
The priest would cut the head, the blood would come out, it would sprinkle the blood on the head, I would lay my hand on the top of that animal, transferring my guilt to the animal, and then the priest would be like, okay, we're good, okay, we're good, all right, good, I'm good for another day, and they would go about their business, and God says, stop it. God says, stop it. Stop bringing sacrifices when your life is a mess. God is saying, stop bringing tithe money, stop with all this loud, extravagant worship with all of these different instruments and all this stuff. God says, I hate the show and the pretense and all of the giving of the money. He said, I want to see justice and an endless river of righteous living. But Amos also calls out what I'm going to call wealthy indifference. Now, there's nothing wrong with people being wealthy, but there is something wrong when people are so wealthy that they have no regard for God. And Amos calls this out. He says, how terrible for you who sprawl on ivory beds and lounge on your couches, eating the meat of tender lambs from the flock and of choice calves fattened in the stall. Can you just paint this picture? They're going out to Eddie V's. They're going out to Ruth Chris Steakhouse. They're eating all this choice food and, and they're laying on their, their, their hammocks in the backyard and their ivory beds lounging on their couches and things like that. And then the Bible says that they drink wine, not by the cups, but by the bowl full. I mean, they're just living life, having a good time, and there is no regard for God whatsoever. And perfuming yourselves with fragrant lotions, you care nothing about the ruin of your nation. Like I said, there's nothing wrong with enjoying the blessing that God has given you, but make sure that you are not regarding those things above God. Now, let's keep going because now Amos predicts judgment. It says here, therefore, you will be the first to be led away as captives. Suddenly, all your parties will end. God is saying time is ticking because pretty soon I'm getting ready to bring the hammer down, but I'm just warning you right now. So I'm going to give you some time to repent. Remember, that was the point of these prophets. They were prophesying to give the people time to repent. But I want you to notice how they responded to Amos's prophecy. And I want you to think about how people respond to prophets today. See, prophets today are mostly respected, mostly revered, mostly loved, liked. But that wasn't the case with these prophets. It says here, then Amaziah sent orders to Amos, get out of here, you prophet. Go on back to the land of Judah and earn your living by prophesying there. We don't want to hear what you have to say. Get out of here. Go somewhere else. Bring us a good, come back whenever you have a good message for us. And isn't that where we are today? Now let's return to our chart and that brings us over to here, Hosea. Now, there's something very, very important that you need to know about Hosea's prophecy. You might ask the question, why is it that there were no other prophets prophesying to the northern kingdom after Hosea? Well, it's because God saved his strongest and most powerful prophet for last. The idea here is this. Hosea's message is going to be so strong that if they do not respond to Hosea's message, they're not going to respond to anyone's message. Let's quickly see what Hosea had to say to these northern 10 tribes. In verse 2 of chapter 1, it says, When the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, he said to him, Go and marry a prostitute so that some of her children will be conceived in prostitution. Now, this is a great verse here because it reminds us of a very, very important principle, and that is this. God's main priority for you and I is not our happiness. See, if God's main priority for Hosea was his happiness, God would have been like, oh, you know what? I really want to teach Hosea and the nation of Israel a lesson, but I can't do that because if I ask Hosea to marry a woman who's going to be unfaithful to him, then he's not going to be happy, so I can't do that. No, God has a plan, and his plan does not always involve, first and foremost, the priority of us being happy. So let me explain to you what's happening here. God is going to tell Hosea to marry a woman who later on will be unfaithful to him. Why? Because God needs Hosea to understand firsthand how it feels for someone that he loves so much to turn their back on him, to be unfaithful to him. Because if Hosea can understand that in his 
personal life, then he will also be able to correctly and adequately communicate how God feels to the people who have been going astray and being unfaithful to him. See, it says right here, this will illustrate how Israel has acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshiping other gods. It was an object lesson for Hosea, a sad one at that. And so now Hosea predicts judgment is coming. He says, I will strip her naked in public while all her lovers look on. Now, this is symbolic language where God is talking about what he's going to do to the nation of Israel. He's going to expose their sinfulness so that other nations will be able to see it. No one will be able to rescue her from my hands. I will punish her for all those times when she burned incense to her images of Baal, when she put on her earrings and jewels and went out to look for her lovers, but forgot all about me. God says, I'm the one that takes care of you. I'm the one that planted you. I'm the one that provides for you. I'm the one that protects you. And yet you looking for help from, you're looking for help for all these other nations and you don't even come to me. You've completely forgotten about me. Isn't that a practical message for us today? That it's possible for us to be looking for all of these other things and looking to all these other things to help us rather than placing our faith and our trust in God. So now, my friend, that brings us to the end of the Northern Kingdom. And what is going to happen here is that God is going to allow a foreign nation called Assyria to come into the northern kingdom and dispossess it and scatter it. And they're never, ever going to return to that part of the land again. Now, I want to read about it. There's a lot of verses here. I want you to follow along in your Bible. And I'm specifically going to take my time and not rush through because if you got to the end of this video or this point of the video, rather, you're already invested and you really want to see how this story is actually going to end. So I'm going to take my time and I'm going to read for you in the book of 2 Kings exactly what happened when Assyria came in and dispossessed the land. Let's read it in detail. Starting in verse 5, it says, Then the king of Assyria invaded the entire land, and for three years he besieged the city of Samaria. Remember, Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom. Finally, in the ninth year of King Hoshea's reign, Samaria fell, and the people of Israel were exiled to Assyria. They were settled in colonies in Hala, along the banks of the Habor River, in Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes. This disaster came upon the people of Israel, remember Israel, the northern ten tribes, because they worshipped other gods. Bingo, there it is. God says, I'm, this, the writer of uh, 2 Kings says, this is why it happened. They sinned against the Lord their God who had brought them safely out of Egypt and had rescued them from the power of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. They had followed the practices of the pagan nations the Lord had driven from the land ahead of them as well as the practices the kings of Israel had introduced. Yes, they worshiped idols, despite the Lord's specific and repeated warnings. Again and again, the Lord had sent his prophets and seers to warn both Israel and Judah, turn from all your evil ways. Remember Elijah? Remember Elisha? Remember Micah? Remember Amos? Remember Hosea? Those are all the prophets that the writer of 2 Kings is talking about. He said, I've, I've sent you the warnings. Obey my commands and decrees, the entire law that I commanded your ancestors to obey and that I gave you through my servants, the prophets. But the Israelites would not listen. They were as stubborn as their ancestors who had refused to believe in the Lord, their God. They rejected his decrees and the covenant he had made with their ancestors and they despised all his warnings. They worshiped worthless idols, so they became worthless themselves. They followed the example of the nations around them, disobeying the Lord's command not to imitate them. They even, here it is, sacrificed their own sons and daughters in the fire. Does that sound like something that we do in America today? Hmm. Killing our own children got them into trouble. 
They consulted fortune tellers and practiced sorcery and sold themselves to evil, arousing the Lord's anger. But the Lord, because the Lord was very angry with Israel, he swept them away from his presence. Only the tribe of Judah remained in the land. So this, my friend, brings us to the end of the northern 10 tribes. But I want you to notice that that last verse says, now only the tribe of Judah or the kingdom of Judah remained in the land. Now you might ask, well, why are they still there? Because as you see in this chart right here, there were some good kings. That is the, the re, uh, that's the, the benefit of having good godly leadership. God was more patient with the southern kingdom because there actually were some good or maybe even some average kings. I want you to notice at the very bottom of this chart, the time periods in which these kingdoms were disciplined or punished. The northern 10 tribes were scattered by Assyria in 722 BC. But there's about 130 or 40 years or so later where God said, you know, I'm going to give the southern kingdom a little bit more time to repent because they were not as bad as the northern kingdom. Why? Because they had godly leadership from time to time. And they fell to their demise in 586 BC. And now we're going to switch our attention and focus over to there to see what happened to the southern kingdom. So this now brings us to a prophet whose name is Jeremiah. And we're going to take a look at a couple of verses from the book of Jeremiah so you can get an idea of what his prophecy was all about. O people of Judah and Jerusalem, surrender your pride and power. Change your hearts before the Lord, or my anger will burn like an unquenchable fire because of all your sins. So you can see here that he's talking to the southern kingdom, Judah and Jerusalem. So the next thing that I want to do is I want you to notice how these prophets were treated by the people. Very, very different than how the modern day prophets are treated now. First thing we notice here is that Jeremiah was mocked. Do we mock the prophets of today? No, we don't. We revere them. Oh Lord, you misled me and I allowed myself to be misled. You are stronger than I am and you overpowered me. Now he's talking about the fact that in Jeremiah chapter one, verse five, God came to Jeremiah and said, Hey, I had a plan for you. I've set you apart as a prophet to the nations from birth, even when you're in your mother's womb. And that sounded like a good, a good plan for Jeremiah. He was like, okay, cool. Sign me up. I'll be a prophet. That's cool. Little did Jeremiah know that he was going to have to experience all sorts of turmoil and trouble in his life. And that's what he's referring to. He said, God, you misled me. I thought this prophet thing was going to be glamorous. Instead, I'm over here struggling. Notice now I am mocked every day. Everyone laughs at me. Why? Because he was bringing a message of judgment. He was not only mocked, he was banned from the temple. Then Jeremiah said to Baruch, I am a prisoner here and unable to go to the temple. But not only that, his scroll that he was writing down these judgments was burned. People didn't want to hear it. Each time Jehudi finished reading three or four columns, the king took a knife and cut off that section of the scroll. He then threw it into the fire section by section until the whole scroll was burned up. They didn't want to hear what Jeremiah had to say, so they were burning his scrolls. He was also beaten and put in prison. They were furious with Jeremiah and had him flogged and imprisoned in the house of Jonathan the secretary. Jonathan's house had been converted into a prison. Now, there's a lot more that we could talk about with regard to Jeremiah's prophecy, but we want to keep this thing moving along. And now we're going to move on to another prophet whose name was Habakkuk. And you might be familiar with Habakkuk. Let's read a little bit about him and his message to the southern kingdom. He starts off his prophecy and he says, How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Let's just stop right there. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt frustrated with God because you're calling out to God? You're asking him for help. And it seems like God is not listening. It seems like God is not doing anything. Well, my friend, Habakkuk experienced that same level of frustration. He says, violence is everywhere. I cry, but you do not come to save. So you have to understand that in this time, the land was not safe. The law was paralyzed, right? The, 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 the uh, judges were taking bribes. And if you didn't have the money to bribe the judges, you couldn't be uh, 
uh, get a fair case in court. So if you were poor, there was no justice for you. The rich were oppressing the poor. There was no law that was going forth. And so Habakkuk's like, God, do you not see this? Do you not see this? Like, I, am I the only one seeing this craziness that's going on around here? Violence, people killing folk. Uh, I'm crying to you, Lord. You're not doing anything. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I'm surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed. See, that's what I was saying. There is no law anymore. Can you imagine a, a, a world full where the law is not being carried out by the people who are supposed to carry out justice? Hmm. Sounds a little interesting sometimes. Is that happening at all in our world? And there is no justice in the courts. Hmm. The wicked far outnumber the righteous so that justice has become perverted. The Lord replied, look around at the nations, look and be amazed for I am doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. So I can imagine Habakkuk's like, yes, finally got an answer from God. All right, God, tell me what you're doing. This is going to be great. It's good to know that you're doing something, right? What, you're, what are you up to, God? What are your plans? And God says, I'm raising up the Babylonians, a cruel and violent people. They will march across the world and conquer other lands. And I can imagine Habakkuk saying, no, no, God, the Babylonians, like they are more wicked than we are. And you're going to use them to accomplish your plan? That doesn't even make any sense. Notice he says here, oh Lord, my God, my Holy One, you who are eternal, surely you do not plan to wipe us out. Oh Lord, our rock, you have sent these Babylonians to correct us, to punish us for our many sins. This doesn't make any sense to Habakkuk. But you are pure and cannot stand the sight of evil. Will you wink at their treachery? In other words, do you not see what they're doing? I mean, you're paying a whole lot of attention to us, but do you not see what the Babylonians are doing? Have you ever felt that way, right? Why, why is it that I can't get a break, God? Don't you see what my friends are doing over there? They're worse than us. Should you be silent while the wicked, the Babylonians, swallow up people more righteous than they, i.e. us? He's frustrated. Now let's return to the prophecy of Jeremiah and let's see what Jeremiah was saying to the people. Notice it says here, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel says. Do not let your prophets and fortune tellers who are with you in the land of Babylon trick you. Do not listen to their dreams. Ooh, it's about to get real, real practical now. He's saying, hey, there's some false prophets in the land that are basically telling you that you are not, that, that nothing is going to happen, that judgment isn't going to happen. He said, don't listen to them. Don't listen to those false prophets who want to tell you that everything is going to be good because God is basically saying through Jeremiah, it ain't going to be good. Judgment is coming. He said, because they are telling you lies in my name. They're saying, well, thus says the Lord, God told me. I have not sent them, says the Lord. This is what the Lord says. He says, if you want to know what I'm saying, listen to me, Jeremiah says, you will be in Babylon for 70 years. Get comfortable there. Build homes. Intermarry or marry, marry there. Have families right? You're going to be there for 70 years, so get comfortable. But then after that time, I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised, and I will bring you home again. And this brings us to the verse that many Christians love to use, and they love to quote, but they seldom understand Jeremiah 29 11 in its context. In this context, God says, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a hope in a future. See, these people who were in Babylon at this time, or were getting ready to go to Babylon rather, they, they were uh, worried that God's plan for them, that, that God didn't have a plan for them anymore. And as a result, God had to send Jeremiah to them and say, hey, no, 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 I still love you. I still have plans for you. Plans to give you a hope in a future, not to harm you, but to prosper you. And that is the context for Jeremiah 29, 11. So now, my friend, that brings us to the end of the southern kingdom. And this happens in 586 BC. And at this point, God is going to displace the southern kingdom and allow them to be taken captive by the Babylonians. Remember, in 722 BC, 
God allowed the northern kingdom of Israel to be scattered by Assyria. And they're no more. They're gone. But now in 586 BC, really started in 605 BC, I believe. But it ended in 586 BC, where now there is this captivity taking place for 70 years. And we're going to end by reading about it. Now, do you remember in 2 Kings chapter 17, we read about the northern kingdom falling to Assyria. Now in 2 Kings chapter 24, we're going to read about how the southern kingdom fell to the Babylonians. During Jehoiakim's reign, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon invaded the land of Judah. Jehoiakim surrendered and paid him tribute for three years, but then rebelled. Then the Lord sent bands of Babylonian, Aramean, Moabite, and Ammonite raiders against Judah to destroy it, just as the Lord had promised through his prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, all of these guys, right? As the Lord had said beforehand, Nebuchadnezzar had carried away all the treasures from the Lord's temple and the royal palace. God allowed a foreign evil wicked king whose name was Nebuchadnezzar to come in and literally carry away all of the, uh, of the expensive treasures from the temple of God and the palace of, 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 of the king. He stripped away all the gold objects that King Solomon of Israel had placed in the temple. King Nebuchadnezzar took all of Jerusalem captive, including all the commanders and the best of the soldiers, craftsmen and artisans, 10,000 in all. Only the poorest people were left in the land. But notice what else this wicked king did. He burned down the temple of the Lord, the royal palace, the temple that Solomon took seven years to build. And then the royal palace that Solomon took 14 years to build, King Nebuchadnezzar just burnt them down. And all the houses of Jerusalem, he burned down. He destroyed all the important buildings in the city. Then he supervised the entire Babylonian army as they tore down the walls of Jerusalem on every side. So now there's no protection for the city of Jerusalem. And my friend, this brings us to the place in the Old Testament where both the northern 10 tribes of Israel and the southern two tribes of Judah have both been destroyed. They have been taken captive. They have been scattered. And they are going to be in captivity for 70 years. Now, I'm going to come back maybe in a week or two and do a follow-up video where I basically pick up the story here. And we're going to look at what was happening during these 70 years of captivity who the main people were, who were ministering to these people, and then how they were able to come back into the land and rebuild it, and who was responsible for all of those things. So look out for that video. Once again, if you enjoyed this video or this type of deep teaching that I've done today, advanced type of teaching for the advanced Bible student, you're at a point where you're really wanting to go deeper in your understanding of the Word of God. If you're tired of the surface stuff. I really want to encourage you to click the link below this video so you can join our online community. I have a monthly Bible study every first Monday of every month of where I do these types of long in-depth teachings. I normally do it for about 60 to 90 minutes. My wife does a women's Bible study uh, on the second Tuesday of every month. I do a monthly Q&A. We have monthly challenges there and all sorts of other things. It's not a private Facebook group. It's an, actually a community that we built up from the ground up and I would love for you to be a part of it. The link is in the description box below. I'll see you in the next video. I hope you enjoyed this. Bye for now.